Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Decoding AQ. With me today, I have Anita Letting. She's joining us from the Netherlands, so welcome. Hey, Ross and audience. Very nice to be here, and thank you for the invitation. So Anita is a HR and a payroll tech advisor, a keynote keynote speaker. She works, in fact, with HR leaders and VCs and startups in a variety of ways, an author and a Web3 explorer. So you've been recognized as a top 25 global thought leader on the future of work. So I can't wait to dive into that in a moment, Mm -hmm. as well as a top 10 HR innovator and a top 100 HR tech influencer. So over the last two decades, you've uh, been in and around the consulting, corporate and executive leadership roles within some of the largest companies, but your work has always focused on making HR work better for everyone. And these insights that you share and perspectives about the future of work, including pay, but also maybe some of the more emerging trends, emerging opportunities in Web3 and the metaverse and what they'll bring. But before we dive into background and all of those things, what I want to ask you, Anita, is um, we start many of our internal meetings with a positive focus. And we ask people and invite them to share something that either they're really grateful for or a win, achievement over the past, say, 30 days. So for you, what's been something you're grateful for or a win over the last 30 days? What I'm really grateful for over the last 30 days is I published a book and it's called How to Select Your Next Payroll. And I sold over 100 copies without any advertising. So I'm really grateful for that because it means I have an audience and I have also been approached by some people who bought the book uh, um, and they came up to me and said how it is helping them uh, with their thinking around buying a new payroll. So it means it serves a need and that is important. That's great. It's interesting. I've uh, just recorded another one today, another podcast interview. Because although they come out weekly, I'll go through, you know, phases of recording a load. Right. But also just published a book. And it's such a journey, isn't it, to go through that whole process of figuring out from all the vast information and experience, how do you consolidate it into something Mm -hmm. that makes sense? Tell us a little bit about that journey. And have you, you know, written articles written before? Is this a new uh, area for you? Just tell us a little bit more about the story of the creation of that. Sure. Well, one thing to know about me is I like to write. And I know that words are a little bit of an old fashioned medium these days, especially the written word, but it's my thing. And for the longest time, I've written white papers and blogs and articles and always around HR technology, future work, and payroll. Two years ago, I left the company that I worked for for 20 years or almost 20 years. And I started out on my own and did it. And, and I'm, a, I'm an advisor. And people often reach out to me when they're thinking about a new payroll or buying new HR tech. And earlier this year, I noticed in a newspaper an awful lot of articles about payroll implementations gone wrong. Uh, You had a few of those in the UK as well. And what that means typically is that people don't get the right amount in their bank accounts, cannot pay their mortgages, their insurances, have to loan money from others, and in some instances have to go to the food bank because they have no money left. And I thought, what is going on here? And so I dove into the story behind the story. And I discovered that it wasn't really one vendor. It wasn't really one solution. And so I started to have some conversations and what I discovered was it was almost always the preparation. So that something goes wrong early on in the process where for instance, the buyers aren't very forthcoming about what they really need. 
or don't supply the right data to the vendors. And the vendors don't ask the right questions. And so what I decided to do was write a book for the buyers where I put all my knowledge, everything I learned over, you know, in over 20 years of advising people how to buy payroll or how to implement payroll so that at least they can start out on a bit more equal terms because you have to, you have to remember that buyers select a new payroll every five, maybe every 10 years. But vendors do this for a living, right? So there's an enormous information gap between the two of them. And what I'm trying to do with the book is bridge that gap so that they are on more equal footing. And the interesting thing is that I have discovered that also vendors are buying the book. So that's interesting. And I guess where this relates to maybe the future of work is what is the new vision of the contract of employment and how do we employ people today versus tomorrow is going to need a lot more flexibility a lot more shift and, and innovation in that space so what are some of the things that people might not even be aware of that is actually happening from the traditional thought of our oh, payrolls it happens every month it's the same thing apart from every year when maybe it goes up a bit what's the reality in that niche, in that world of what's really going on in some of the new niches and new ways people are going about getting value for their contributions? I think one of the most interesting developments that we see is where for the longest time people had a permanent contract and one salary payment, that is now splitting into income streams. So people might still have one main salary, but they augment that with a little side gig or they have a web shop or they do something else. So managing those different income streams is becoming a little bit more complex for employees. And what we have also learned is that very often mental health issues come from financial problems. And these financial problems are so consuming that it is obvious that people spend so much time thinking about it that they don't bring their best self to work. And in that sense, what you will notice is that employers are going to come a little bit closer or taking a step into the private sphere in something that we, you know, a couple of years ago would say, well, you know, my salary is my thing, get out of here. Um, but now they are offering financial support, um, financial education to really help people take control of their income uh, so that they can also be productive at work. Was there a trigger, Anita, in your own journey over those years of what led you to really maybe focus in this area um, in seeing the impact, as you said, on mental mm -hmm. health or the opportunity of the shifting technology or space? Or was there something else in your own journey that led you into this, you know, niche within a niche, you know, of, of HR, of, of tech, the future of work to actually payroll? Yeah, it's it's been a, a bit of a gradual thing, I think. And it also was caused by the fact that I worked for a company that delivered global services, both HR and payroll. I joined the company because I came from a technology background that they needed. And then slowly but surely, I understood that I needed to understand the focus, HR and payroll as well. So I started learning and learning. And the large companies of the world that were our customers are interesting because their service, their HR and payroll servers is global, but it's also local, right? Because payroll uh, benefits time in the Netherlands is different from what it is in the UK, in Germany, in the United States, in Manila and Philippines. So every country has their own rules. And I enjoy that complexity. I understand it. I've worked in that space for a very long time. And I also see how it affects the well-being of people. So I have seen that if you do not get it right, 
it has consequences far beyond um, the workplace. And I think that is what triggers me to, and, and that is why I find it so interesting, especially when we talk about, you know, employee experience and employee engagement, which are a little bit, I would say, intangible things. But what is very tangible about that is if you do not get the basics right, right, then forget about, you know, engagement and experience. Don't even get, don't even start there. So that is why I find it so interesting. And I guess the opportunity now where things are shifting, we're renegotiating what it means to work mm -hmm. and how we work. And therefore the technology can both be an inspiration and an enabler of what might be possible. But I'm interested maybe more at the fringe edge of things. So if traditionally we might have had those complexities of regulation differences or currency differences, we're now faced with well, what's the audit trail? Is it going in blockchain? Am I going to be paid in a crypto? Am I going to be paid in tokens? Is my benefits going to come from fractional ownership with smart contracts? You know, all of these things that are now emerging as sort of deceptive, sort of maybe geeky things. Where might there be opportunities for people to experiment or explore in that world and in that area of what's the future of the value exchange, essentially, is what we're talking about yeah. between um an em employer and an employee what's some of the thoughts that you have on that anita well the problem that we have here is that paying your employees in crypto is illegal in many countries and so experimentation is good in theory but in practice it's a little difficult having said that there are of course already companies creating crypto that pay their employees in crypto um let's not discuss the legalities because that's a whole different topic but it is happening earlier this year many of those coins were worth a fortune um we're now experiencing a bit of a crypto winter as it is called and so the value of those crypto coins is a lot lower than it was before. And those fluctuations don't help acceptance with employers because imagine you think that you are wiring a thousand euros in crypto to your employee, but by the time they get it, it's only worth 800. Well, it could also be 1200, but... Um, and then they then you won't hear it hear them. But if it's eight hundred, you will hear back from them. So I think that the fluctuations need to subside a little bit. It needs to become a little bit more stable before employers well before we will see mass adoption. And then of course we need to um, also take care of the legalities around it. Having said that. One area where this works already, uh, especially uh, with the help of the blockchain, is in remittance payments. And the, those are payments that you know an employee would make to their family overseas. And um, inflation in a lot of countries is such that you would rather not wire the money through the bank because by the time it arrives, um, it, banks have taken out fees and it's maybe 80% of what you originally wired. And then with inflation, those, um, those it's, it's simply not good practice to hold local currency. And in those cases, crypto helps. So there are applications that are... I guess some of the, the things are around the volatility of any given uh, value whether it's a, a fiat currency, mm -hmm. we've seen massive shift. You know, the dollar to pound has changed exactly. 20, 24% in the last year. And so they are historically more stable. Yes. Whereas crypto is, you know, super volatile. You can be, you know, drinking the pina colada one day and the other one in a dark room sobbing. So I think one element is, yes, uh, crypto allows certain other things and the legalities of whether it's speed of transfer 
um, accessibility, because again, many people in the world are unbanked. You know, the ability mm -hmm. to even have a bank account Absolutely. Yes. is very difficult. And so a lot of countries run even say, for example, on mobile phone credits uh, rather than bank. Uh, and so there's different ways of how, how we might exchange things. Old school, service for a service, um, you know, a barter exchange. A barter, yes. Brother lives in Canada, you know, and they do a lot of bartering, help him build the home with a, somebody who has a particular skill and exchange that for another skill. And actually, that's still an exchange of value. It's just a different one. I'm interested in terms of the sort of your vision for how organizations need to be aware of not only where work is done and how it's done. So it might be, you know, hybrid and remote to now maybe work is done inside different uh, environments. Take the metaverse, for example. And what is happening and what is shifting around how people contribute and then how do we see the value that's created in some of those areas and some of those pieces you know we've just seen some properties being bought as a nft token so an nft token is now uh you know directly linked to a physical object not necessarily just a digital object and so i'm just fascinated by this whole world of this mass change that's coming along how do we deal with that with as you said in educating employees or employers mm -hmm. on what's possible and then making the decisions of when's the right time to do these things and so i'm fascinated about your thoughts of those those areas yeah i think it's a little bit too early and i'll tell you why that is i have a niece and a nephew and they are 22 and 20 and i was talking to them and some other students about the metaverse and would they consider wearing VR all day? Um, and I know that they are very skilled and 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 spend time in 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 world in gaming like and, and worlds like Roblox, right? And to my surprise, they were not interested. And the, one of the most important reasons for that is the pandemic. They have spent two years by themselves in their dorm rooms, not seeing a whole lot of people and not being able to go to physical uh, classrooms. And since, I would say since early summer, that has all changed and everyone is out and about. Um, they can go back to festivals. They are in back in the classroom and they are so happy to be together and to meet in person that when I was talking about this, they were looking at me funny and they were like, what? No, no, no. We do not want to meet each other virtually. We want to be together, grab a coffee, grab a drink and have some fun. And so I was actually thinking, and this is just a thinking exercise, that this whole metaverse would maybe or should maybe be geared more towards people who can't leave their home um, or should offer a way for older, less mobile people to participate in events and in society um, and not so much um, young people who want to have experiences but want them in person. But this was just a thought exercise. I know it's not gonna gonna happen, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, it's the Jurassic Park Park quote, isn't it? You know, just because we could, we didn't stop and ask whether we should. Yes. And you know, these technologies exist, and we can think about it. That oh, here's a use case. It's about accessibility or reach. And so we say these people who couldn't do X can now do X. Yes. We have companies like Accenture saying. They've created something called the ninth floor. All of the onboarding, your first day onboarding will happen yes. in the metaverse. You know, 100,000 people a year going in and, and we can think, ah, oh, great. Okay, we can simulate experiences. We can connect people. We're connected. Netherlands uh, to here, it's a transportation system called Zoom. Uh, exactly. We still have a human yearning 
feel connection and belonging. And I think there'll always be this blend, but from a future of work perspective is, is it a, a sense where it's too early? When is too early? When is too late? I think might be relevant to the context of the both challenge because it's way too late if you've been excluded and you want to be yes. excluded. Um, and it's too early if I don't like that and I don't want to do it and I want to do this thing. So I'm not ready to until I then am faced with a situation where I can't go and do it. If we have that choice, I think we always will have that choice. How will that affect the way organizations support people through those transitions? Because it's going to be different playbooks, different processes, mm -hmm. different structures, different regulations of what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. I'm just really curious as to what's happening in that space of the sort of um, playbooks of how to behave in the thinking as a leadership level in that area of work. I think what what is what we see, and that was also I wrote a little article on LinkedIn about it, is that sales and marketing and IT departments are running pilots, but from an HR perspective, there's not much traction yet. And my post was meant as an encouragement, but also as a call to action to HR professionals to really dive deep and understand what this is and what it could potentially mean for work, for culture, for how we treat each other when we are avatars in some virtual land and not wait until it's all done and then you raise your hand and say, oh, but by the way, we need a policy or some agreement on how we will behave there because by then it's too late and things have been created. And so it's a fat at complete. And so my, my, my call is really to people to, even if you think that it's not going anywhere, you should still understand what it is how it works, what it could potentially mean for you before you put it aside or before you say, well, it's too early. It might take another three to four years. Um, even if we don't end up uh, working in a virtual office or visiting a virtual land, there might be areas where this does apply and where this is a killer app and it might touch your workforce. And so you need to have you need to form an opinion, at least a base opinion, that you can gradually adjust as we progress and as this maybe comes closer. I think it's a question, isn't it, about the experience. What is it adding and what is it causing as friction? If it's, ah, oh, we want day to day. I, I uh, spoke years ago to a company, a real estate company, about 600 global staff and four, when I spoke to them, for five years, they've been fully existing of the offices in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. And so where they would go, where they would hang out, where they'd have meetings was all in virtual environment. And that's one thing to do all your day-to-day -day stuff versus, like you said, are you've identified and understood that, hey, maybe the area's in learning, in, in the learning and development, because uh, you might justify and think, ah, I've seen some evidence that there's experiential advantages to learning. We can simulate a very cost-effective basis to deal with diversity and inclusion pieces or new skills or new environments that might be capitally intensive or logistically difficult or yeah. um, maybe socially challenging yes. to put that kind of training in place, that might be those little areas, those little niches for you to experiment and try out that technology in a, in a certain way. So whilst I've seen pockets where people will go, oh, yeah, I think it's learning and development, or someone else will say, I think it's here. Finding what's right for you is perhaps the opportunity to be playful in there. Is there anything that you've observed or seen in, in teams, in leadership teams, or in, in companies where they are 
embracing new things differently or thinking about the types of skills that they need to adopt that you could perhaps share um, to help others think differently about what's mm, not for me or it's, you know, geeky or it just happens in gaming or those areas that you think they might be, should have their antenna up for? Yeah, I think so. In 2018, I wrote, I wrote a blockchain series as an example. And I really thought that this would be something that would be applicable in HR and payroll, not as a payroll engine, but in adjacent uh, services. And shortly before the summer, I asked my newsletter audience, what would you like me to write about? And one of them sent me an uh, email and said, I would like to have an update on blockchain in HR. Where is it? And so I revisited what I wrote. And back then I had created a list of 25 companies that were creating solutions, HR solutions on a blockchain. And from them, only five exist today. And only two of them still work on blockchain. The other three have pivoted to something else. And so sometimes we think there is something there, but when we start to experiment, it turns out there's nothing, or at least it, it, it doesn't work as we expect. We did the same thing internally. We started to experiment with blockchain and we discovered that as a payroll engine, it makes no sense because it's too resource um, intensive and you, you don't need to have all the steps on a ledger because you know calculating a payroll is millions of transactions. So that is absolutely unmanageable if you do that 12 times a year or maybe you know maybe more if you have weekly uh, if you have weekly payroll. But the fact that we did experiment with it allowed us to discover other areas where it would make sense. Right. For instance, in um, in an exchange with an employee, so that you are absolutely sure on both ends that you've had that exchange, that this was the question and this was the answer. Um, and I'm not going to say that all questions and answers between HR and employees lead to court cases, but in a case that it does, then you have the evidence on the blockchain and it is immutable, so you know that that was what took place. Um, so by experimenting, we discovered what made sense and what didn't make sense for us. And therefore, I always encourage people to, you know, don't talk about the metaverse from a theoretical perspective where you've seen some video on YouTube and you think that it is not for you. Buy or borrow a headset and just experiment with it, try it and see if it works. Because um, while I don't look forward to wear headsets um, for meetings, what I did really enjoy was visit a couple of museums uh, in as, you know, virtually um, that I couldn't travel to, but the experience was completely different from looking at the art through a browser. So sometimes an immersive experience adds something to the experience itself. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And I think, you know, we've got realms in this spectrum of how we might show up to um, provide value to society from learning to creating art to doing tasks and roles that, you know, maybe humans are acting like robots already and some of that should be taken over by machines mm -hmm. and the thought of ah why would I take a mobile phone with me when the technology was bulky when it was prohibitive and I'd experiment to now where people don't wear watches anymore because they've always got their phone so they just yeah. have the time then they <laughs> do all of these things to I remember trying in on some contact lenses that were augmented reality contact lenses. And so they were able to project and understand 
uh, both the situation and the reality and give me a different layer of data of information. So from a all oh, bulky headset to a smaller headset to glasses that have failed, but at some point, the technology will be not the point. It'll be the uh, what the result is of the experience. Yes. And so I don't think about all oh, my knife for when I'm cutting up my veg as being a piece of technology, but I try to cut the veg before a knife and it would be very difficult. Mm -hmm. so I think the same will be true of a lot of these areas of, ah, metaverse way out there. But actually, if I'm on site and I'm looking at something complex, would I look up and in an old book and an old manual of what's wrong? Or would I want to put an overlay and it shows me, ah, this is wrong. Exactly. That's the part number. That's this piece. And we can, we can then shift where the knowledge is held. So knowledge used to be held at the point of, um, you know, use. And then you went in technology, you'd have dumb terminals, you'll have it centralized and the terminal doesn't need to carry all that weight. If we become just the end terminal, do we need all that same level of education, that same level of knowledge, if it's actually easily accessible? And therefore, what then becomes the opportunity of creativity, of what are the skills if the expertise or knowledge is now much more proliferated? You know, we can get an answer to most things if we have connection to the internet, but we might not know what are the right questions to ask. <laughs> and so I think that comes to your book is that, you know, often the beauty is what are the right questions? If we don't do something very often, five year, 10 year purchasing payroll, we don't know what to ask. So I think the same is true in these skills and these new technology. We don't really know what to ask until we play with it a little bit. So is there, um, so you experimented, you said with blockchain, have you experimented with anything else? Uh, what has it been and what have you learned from that? Well, uh, VR and AR. Um, and my preliminary conclusion is that there is, there is use for, there are use cases for both of them. I just, at the moment, don't see a way where my full day would be spent, my full work day would be spent in virtual reality. And you have to be very clear on, but I think that has always been the case. You must be very clear on what you win with a certain technology when you apply it. Because otherwise you create something because of the technology and that never gives you that killer use case that people really enjoy, right? that virtual visit to the museum existed before this whole metaverse thing started last year. And that was an application for virtual reality glasses, just as uh, what you just talked about, um, teaching people skills in, in, in conditions that are very dangerous or that are very costly um, can be replaced by teaching skills in a virtual simulation. And that is, an, that is an excellent use case because you can immediately understand why you would do that, why you would, would not send somebody out to the middle of the ocean yep. right, to work on an oil platform, but instead say, look, we'll simulate that here in the office. And then you go ahead and we'll see if you can actually complete the exercise. And if you have done this 10 times and you have your certification, then, then we'll send you out. Um, that is an enormously good and appropriate use of technology, but then you're not talking about virtual land. It is actually something that people need and that, that is better than what they did before. So I really always try to be very practical and pragmatic about these types of things, because let's not forget, you talked earlier about um, Accenture having to onboard all these people through virtual reality. Well, first of all, you need to buy a, a headset for everyone. And second of all, not everyone lives in a location where there is good broadband which you obviously need for a good virtual yeah. experience. So there are things to take into account when you do, uh, when you develop these um, ideas or concepts, 
you must understand who your audience is. And if your audience is able and capable to take advantage of it. And I think that is one of the other um, problems that we're currently seeing because of the limitations and the, the external limitations around some of these new technologies. It is difficult to bring it into the mainstream. So it will remain for early adopters for a while, which is never bad. I mean, the iPhone was, I mean, the first four years of the iPhone were, oh, it was a thing for early adopters. It was expensive. People had, you know, people had Nokia's that they loved mm -hmm. and they didn't really understand why they had to um, change and, and be, for, for, for a phone that could also take pictures and, and, and play music. It wasn't until uh, the iPhone 4 in 2012 or 2011 or around that when a lot of additional apps were published that people suddenly realized, hey, this is nice. If I put this phone in my, uh, in my pocket, um, I also have a map. And when I don't know where I am, I can look at the map and ask for directions. So those types of killer apps almost. Yeah do not exist yet but once they are there I, i'm pretty sure that um user adoption will increase we're just very early in the process i think it's interesting because simulation as you mentioned about oil rigs or aviation it's been around for decades yeah. in in construction you know learning to use big rigs in shipping all areas where the risk of failure is high stakes mm -hmm. And you want to get from theory and classroom to practical out in the field yes. with mitigating that risk. And so part of that learning that stimulated a lot of these simulations, physical and digital simulations. I think there's an interesting opportunity here where we are seeing a, a, a transformation of the types of roles and the types of tasks we do at work and the decoupling from our identity are oh, so this second thing we ask somebody is so what do you do after we know their name mm -hmm. and we're so wedded to oh i'm an accountant i'm an entrepreneur i'm a and we we label ourselves to that but then all of the thousands of tasks that we do that make up that title is what are the risks now oh i've got to go and reskill i want to go from here to here so it's a lot of effort a lot of thought a lot of moving parts what if i could go and like i was a kid i put on my fireman's outfit and i play fireman for the day and i play a doctor for a day and i play these different roles i think there's an opportunity where we don't know what we don't know if we've always been the operator in this machine or always been this person in this department that we could even believe we're capable of these other things and uh, sometimes to be able to go and explore, try them out in a safe place to just uh, peak interest, let mm -hmm. alone now we need to get you fully capable. I think there can be this opportunity of just this fun blend between playful uh, inspiration and creativity to just help someone step out of themselves when they are under pressure of, so what do I do? What do I do next? And that might be an age generation, or it could be a particular niche. Ah, that's going away. So I, I'm, I'm so interested as to the opportunities of this tech, but the most important point you made was it's not just technology for technology's sake. Now, where's the problem? <laughs> Is looking at what's the real human challenge in, in work. In terms of trying to think about how do we navigate all of this, all of this noise? What is signal? What is noise? What is, it's too early, too late. What are some of the things that um, beyond try it out, experimenting, what else could we do and could HR leaders do to help equip themselves to be more prepared uh, as the moving sands and the, the changes mm -hmm. come? I think that, it is always good to familiarize yourself with what is happening in adjacencies or maybe outside of your profession. And one of the things I enjoy is um, just go on YouTube and find a, find a video that 
maybe is not in my immediate area of interest, but that I just think that, hmm, sounds like a very interesting speaker. I want to know more about that topic. Let's hear it. And you don't have to listen to the whole speech, but at least if you live, if you don't like it, but sometimes you like it and it gives you some new, new perspectives. Um, the same with, for instance, if you like that reading books, do not always read the same books, you know, do not always read the same business book, grab a history book or maybe a psychology book or as or a science book. So get out of your track and move into another track that you don't know so much about. Don't buy the most difficult book that you can find or <laughs> don't go, if you wanna know a little bit more about technology, don't go right away to MIT, but see what is, what, see what else is out there. Because I always find that there are things to be learned from other fields and that things that you can apply to your own field that are not so straightforward. But when you look at other fields and some, sometimes the ideas just start clicking. Oh, they do it this way in finance. That could be very interesting for us as well. Oh, they use that approach uh, in procurement. Hmm, maybe I could use that as well. And it's not something that comes very natural, I think, to, um, to business leaders, but it's certainly something that would be helpful. The one thing that I always thought that when I was um, was leading a business, I first led a Dutch business and then Northern Europe, was my, my one wish was always, I wish I could work for this and that company for a week, um, just like a sort of an intern and experience what their problems are and how they solve things. And then, as you know, we had like a consulting and outsourcing business but then I really thought I want to work for a week at a manufacturing plant or, um, you know, a, or, or a pharmaceutical company or maybe an airline just to experience something totally different and bring that then back into your own, uh, into your own company. And I'm sure there, there must be a program for that for business leaders. I never took advantage of it, but it must be so great. It's interesting, isn't it? This thought of, adjacent lanes go and have a dance in other tracks and yes. we can do that on the fringes we can get some books we can watch some videos but the difference to then go and land in that other lane mm -hmm. and go and have a look around because you will see and hear things very differently and i i, I remember watching a video of um steve jobs talking about the power of asking and just asking people and asking them for help and those sorts of things. And a lot of the time we think, ah, oh, we need a complex structure, right? So we need a program. Yeah. We need all these companies to sign into a charter that says we're going to swap people around. <laughs> and well, what if that person's more valuable, paid more than that one? And they're sort of, how do we deal with it? And suddenly it becomes uber complex and three years down the line, nothing's bloody happened right right so the uh, alternative to going hey i'm a leader i've got some trust from my company i've got a level of autonomy and they believe in this piece i'm gonna phone up a buddy or somebody i've heard of over there and say can i come and hang out for a week mm -hmm. um would you be cool with that okay what are the terms what are the bits don't let me into your secret labs but i'd love to do this bit is that cool go off and do it and i think people would be surprised how willing and open people are in sharing, in mm -hmm. wanting to educate, in wanting to transfer knowledge, in wanting to separate, uh, celebrate that. Now, maybe a starting point could even be within the same blooming company. You know, how often do we do that? Exactly. Employee mobility. Or we talk about silos and, hey, let's get together at these various, you know, retreats, offsites. What about not offsite? It's just the day to day. Go in and hang out. Go into those those sessions. And I spoke, I want to share, because I'm still blown away by this fact. I spoke to a guy, a senior guy in HR at uh, S&P uh, Global and very large organization. And they have a zero day policy for an employee shifting to a different role. So the employee mobility, I could decide, hey, I want to go from here over to that one over there. And I've got no notice, no friction. I can just go and do it. Okay. And I was like, wow. 
you know, how do you pull that off? Because are you leaving a fire behind, massive gap, mm-hmm. what's the transition, all of those sorts of things that maybe these sort of little moments of where you can go and hang out in other areas, have that permission to be able to have space to do it. And I think the challenges at the moment is the intensity, that speed of technology, speed of change, high stress, high overwhelm, we potentially don't give ourselves that room to really go and just experiment because, well, where's the ROI? How quickly is going to be? Uh, what else is being done? And we, we under pressure are making choices that potentially could mean we're not here anymore because we don't see yeah. it until it's too late. So I, I'm, I think as I talk, that's how I, how I function. <laughs> and, okay. and, um, so if we're navigating it in that way, and I liked your idea of going adjacencies, uh, blending, I'll give you an opportunity to reflect back on what I said before I come up with a final question or two for you, Anita. No, I think that companies, what I was thinking about during your, um, during your answer was that I recently spoke to an HR leader who puts their next year's org chart on the board and everyone understands that it is penciled in, but it also gives everyone an opportunity to think about, we're here today, next year, my role is going to be a little bit different, but hey, I also see something really interesting in that unit. And I thought that was so interesting from a, let's, be first of all, from a transparency point of view, let's be very transparent where this organization is headed. And I also asked him, but what if next year it isn't it isn't like that? Something happens and you have to change it. And he said, everyone understands that. We do that with the understanding that it might not materialize, but this is today where we think we are headed. And the beauty of it is that, is that it also gives people an incentive for training and development. Because when you think that you, you want another position, now is the time to talk to your manager and say, hey, I want to end up there next year. Can I go and learn this? Can I go and do that? And they have incentivized their leadership to have these conversations and to stimulate their people to actually help employees grow. Um, It's also in the KPIs. And especially now with so much uncertainty and and so much change because of new digital skills and companies being very agile and constantly reacting to external changes, I thought this was a great way to make it tangible to employees. And also from a company leadership, you have to think about your strategy and you have to be a lot more tangible about it when you have to put next year's or you know, two years from now, um, the org chart on the board. It was such a, a relatively simple thing and it generates so much goodwill and will to change with the company because you know where it's headed. So I thought that was impressive. I love that idea. And I think the next year's org chart in pencil Yes. and post that out. And of course you need then the infrastructure behind to support those predictions, those yeah. thoughts, those uh, pieces, but what better way of, it's a bit like, you know, sell the tickets first and then create the show. Mm-hmm. Many people think, well, I've got to have all those things in place. I've got to support it. Do it, and it will make you respond to that. It will make you uh, think about your training, think about your development, think about the policies to allow people to navigate. Love that idea. Yeah, and so also you drive the change through your employees, right? Because they are starting to prepare themselves to get there. And while they're doing that, they are also already realizing yeah. The change, it's, right? Because what you learn today, you don't sit on that until yeah. you make your move, right? You When you learn something new, you start to 
apply that in your daily job as well. You, but it was, I thought that was very, very smart. Very smart. You know, you, uh, this you know, prediction and the anticipation through a direction and through a filter. Yes. Um, rather than, well, I think some of these things, because I've read this or this is there, but I don't really know what's going on over there. And so it becomes rather than anticipatory and uh, reactive, it becomes proactive, mm-hmm. um, you know, and yeah, very, very powerful, very powerful. So my final question, and it's one I ask all my guests mm-hmm. at the end And it's linked to this whole thought and subject of, you know, how do we adapt? How do we deal with things that are different or new? And it relates to curiosity. Yes. And it's when was the last time you did something for the first time? And what was it? Um, Oh, that's a really good question. When was it that, what did I do? Well, obviously I wrote a book. That was something that I did for the first time that I, when I started, I had no idea if I was going to finish it. I had no idea how much work was involved. I did, I talked to some people about finding a publisher or going the self-published route and, and, um, the answers were mixed, so I decided to do to do self publishing and had to learn that as well. How do you do that? Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of things that I did for the first time, and I learned a lot. Yeah, it's it's beautiful, isn't it? When we set something out that we don't have the capability for, we need courage, and yeah. as we get the courage, we then build out that capability and it gives us some confidence so we can ask others we can learn really what we're capable of and I think that's a lovely place to uh, think for us all is having that you know first mindset being comfortable with things that are unfamiliar unknown and knowing that we can overcome them and we can get the support from people around us to help us through things that Mm -hmm. might be unfamiliar and might be scary but on the other side of it is smiles and unexpected nice things yeah. and unexpected not so nice things, but we keep moving forward. If people want to get in touch with you, if they're uh, curious and interested in uh, your keynotes, your content, your you mentioned your LinkedIn newsletter, how do they best get in touch with you, Anita? Yeah, so they can find me on LinkedIn, Anita Litting. And I also have a website with the same URL. So anitaletting.com. That's probably the easiest way to get in touch. Fantastic. Thank you. We'll put them on the show note links. And it's been a real pleasure to hang out together and chat all things maybe way in the future together with what's happening right now. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ross. It was lovely to be here. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQME assessment. AQAI, transforming the way people, teams and organisations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.